Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This Advent, like many other Advent seasons before, is a getting ready sort of season. It can so easily become a season that is all about doing. Mostly, we get ready by working really hard. And this may be especially true this year as we anticipate a holiday celebrations that look a bit more like what we're used to before the pandemic, when the time leading up to Christmas was a time to cook and clean and decorate and study and take finals and rehearse and attend concerts and write cards and send cards and throw parties and go to parties and shop for just the right gifts for our friends and family. But there is a common understanding among us that this is a very busy time. So what a relief to come to worship on the second Sunday of Advent and hear a promise of peace which is the theme for the day. Yes, isn't that what we need? Peace, a quiet time to put up our feet and rest. Peace, an end to the political bickering and partisan one-upmanship. Peace, the absence of horrific conflict in places all around the world. So what a relief to come here and discover that embedded in this season of is God's promise of peace. Which begs the question, why is it also the Sunday that we hear from John the Baptist, that fiery preacher who referred to his own congregants by the river as, oh, you brood of vipers. His words just don't sound very peaceful. They sound more like John is picking a fight with God's people. Well, according to John, it's not their ancestry that matters to God, that they are, as he puts it, children of Abraham, but what really matters is their actions. So the Quaker civil rights activist Howard Thurman lived from 1899 to 1991. One of his best known works is a poem titled, The Work of Christmas. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flock, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among brothers, to make music in the heart. For us, the song of the angels hasn't yet rung out. The star has barely appeared in the sky. The kings and princes haven't left home yet, and the shepherds haven't received their invitation to the stable. But today's text calls us to look ahead to what Thurman calls the work of Christmas. Apparently, Getting ready for Christmas is not the most important work. Getting ready for Christmas is not the most important work. Because Christmas is not the goal. It is merely the next stage in the ongoing transformation God wants for the world. For all the ways God calls our lives to more clearly reflect God's love and mercy. So if we spend these weeks busy doing things, only doing things, and not heeding the words of John the Baptist, not only are we not going to know peace, we'll never have the energy to attend to the work, the real work of Christmas. In order to do any of that, which Thurman suggests, we have to slow down. We must look with different eyes. We must listen for the prophet's voice. For God's voice, woven into the voice of the prophets, 
is what love sounds like. That God will be known and heard and seen and experienced. John announces what Israel longs for and what the world needs, to see God. And indeed, the world itself will make room for its creator. All that has obstructed the sight of God will be removed. Today, both Isaiah and John the Baptist remind us that preparing a way for God requires some rebalancing, as Isaiah puts it. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. All will angle toward the divine life present in the world. John the Baptist says it a little differently, but he's telling us a similar message. To look at where our lives are out of balance, to make adjustments, to figure out when we have done too much, or taken too much, or acquired too much, or said too much, and to know that we can stop doing, that we can give away, that we can make do with less, and that we can listen instead of speak, that we can take small but meaningful actions that impact the challenges of our time. We do all of this by first making space, not just in our homes and in our places of worship, but in our hearts. Space where Christ might come and dwell and bring us to the very peace for which we desperately long. Peace which names our brokenness so that we can see and join in God's work of becoming whole once again. Steve Garnis Holmes reflects on this in his poem, Prepare the Way. Enough of your junk drawer clutter, bucket of old used pronunciations, heartthrob amusement rides of distraction. Prayer is a snow shovel. You plow it all aside, all of it. Clear a space, admit it. Your heart is a hoarder. Clean out your piety's basement. You don't build the way, don't accrue it, you empty it. Rough made smooth, crooked made straight, busy made empty. Empty it all. Silence the noise, the chorus, the committee, the crowd. The empty place is not long, stretching away. It's just right there around you. A circle of light, empty air, silence. Not what you hear, but how you listen, what you practice. Silence. Now there's a way. Wait for the coming one who speaks silence, who blesses the emptiness the presence who is the negative space itself. There'll be no need for an alternative route to God. No need for more maps to the divine because God came to us, clarified the way and sharpened the view. John announces a new question. No longer do we need to ask where can God be found? Now the only question is, do you see the God who is coming to you? Amen.